Hi there and welcome to this IB biology revision video and today this is video 2 bonding and carbohydrates and this is for the IB from 2023 September onwards um, and just remind you that this isn't a full uh, video there may be bits that you need to revise that are not included in this video and this follows on from the bonding in water um, so some of the content may link to that so just to introduce to you that biological molecules, are the molecules that make up living things, include carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, water, nucleic acid, and obviously water um, we've already covered. The main uh, three elements of, that are found in living things are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, but also nitrogen is uh, critical, particularly in uh, amino acids and therefore proteins. Um, and those four elements make 99% of all living organisms. Um, and there are few, obviously other biological molecules that have extras in like phosphorus, for example, ATP and uh, sulfur. Um, so some amino acids have sulfur in them, uh, which allow the disulfide bonding that you'll talk about later in the course. Um, so first of all, let's just focus on carbon. Now, carbon is a molecule, what we call the molecule of life. All living things rotate around carbon. And if you look at this example here, you can see that carbon makes up uh, molecules that are in uh, sort of straight chains, in circular structures. It can be double bonded, um, it can be single bonded. Um, we won't study it, but even triple bonded. And you can see here carbon makes what we call the backbone of living organisms. So it makes up a lot of the biological molecules you're going to study will have carbon as a backbone. And the reason for this is carbon has what we call a valency of four, which means it can um, combine to four other atoms. So if you imagine your carbon molecule there, okay, it can combine to four other atoms. It has a valency of four. And hence this one is in the middle here. This one is in the middle here. This one here has four. And therefore it gives this structural backbone that is so important. Now, this allows us to make what we call polymers, which are big biomolecules. So basically a polymer is a repeating unit of monomers. So the monomer, for example, of um, carbohydrates is um, a monomer might be glucose and a polymer might be starch. For proteins, it's amino acids and um, for nucleic acids, it's something called a nucleotide. And an example of a nucleic acid would be DNA or RNA. So how these molecules stick together is the main focus of this um, session coming up here. Um, and we'll look at it a bit more in detail in, by the end of this video looking at water. But effectively, molecules stick together and combine from going from monomer to um, two molecules stuck together and then repeatedly into polymers using something called a condensation reaction. And effectively, anytime you talk about condensation reactions in exams or molecules being um, increased in size, stuck together, bonded together, you want to mention the word condensation reaction. You want to identify that when it's condensation, a water molecule is released, so it's removed from the original atoms, forming a new covalent bond. However, I have never seen them accept the word covalent bond in an exam because each type of molecule has a specific covalent bond. So we're going to talk about carbohydrates in a few moments, and the specific type of molecule for that is glycosidic bonds. So I always mention the particular name. So here you can see we have two molecules. We don't need to know what these molecules are here. So here's molecule two and molecule one over the other side. If we want to combine these two, we want to make this bond here. They both have hydroxyl groups on either side. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to remove the water molecule. So what we're going to do is we're using a condensation reaction. This water molecule H, H2O, H2O is going to be removed. That molecule, the water, um, comes out. 
okay and that allows these two atoms to combine leaving an oxygen in the middle and the reason the oxygen is so important is because oxygen has a valency of two so it will combine that one using a bond and it will combine to that one using a bond and this would be your covalent bond um, in the middle of the two here now, if I want to break that molecule apart, I have to reabsorb the water molecule. So this is called a hydrolysis reaction. And a hydrolysis reaction is where I add the water, I hydro, you know, if you hydrate yourself, you're adding water to hydrolysis, you're adding water to the reaction. That breaks the covalent bond and splits this large molecule of water in this case two molecules apart back into the two separate molecules because the water is being added back in to make the OHs either side adding the two hydroxyl groups. So that's it in theory but let's have a look how this actually works in practice. So the next part is carbohydrates and we're going to look at how basic carbohydrates stick together um, and what they're made out of. So if we start off we're going to talk about the fact that carbohydrates make about 10% of organic matter in, in cells. They've got lots of important structural roles, um, energy roles which we'll talk about going through. They contain hydrogen, oxygen and uh, carbon and if you think about it it is effectively a carbohydrate is effectively a hydrated carbon molecule so it's a carbon with a water attached so if you have a look at this formula cn so if that was c1 it would be a one carbon with a h2o if it was c2 it would be one so two carbons and therefore with two water molecules so it's a hydro hydrogenated carbon carbohydrates have one carbon per water molecule the most common one obviously that you will come into contact with is glucose which is a hexo sugar of c6 and then it's each carbon has got one water molecule so therefore it's H12O6 as a result okay and that is just useful to remember so you can always check you've got the carbon numbers right so there are a couple of different groups of carbohydrates that you need to know about um, monosaccharide is when there is a single sugar disaccharide is when there's two sugars and then when there's more than two sugars it becomes a polysaccharide and the condensation reactions is how we would go from mono to di and then further on there is different structures when it comes to um, glucose which is our main focus one you can have a chain structure or you can have a ring structure we'll focus mainly on the ring structure but just be aware it is present there are two what we call isomers of glucose. So an isomer is a molecule that has the same atoms in it, but they're arranged in a different formula. So if you added both of these up, you would see that they both have the same number of carbons. So they both have C6, hydrogens again, H12O6. So they are both isomers of each other. They have the same number of different atoms. However, there is a difference if we look at them at the, um, at the carbons. So when you um, get to know this, you will see that we always label this as carbon one, this one is carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, and then the carbon six is up the top here. Same here, carbon one, two, three, four, five. And you'll see they're almost mirror images of each other, apart from the hydroxyl group on carbon one. Here in alpha glucose, Okay, so I'm going to put an A for alpha there. Okay, is below the um, um, hydrogen carbon one, sorry. Okay, but on beta glucose, and capital B there, the hydroxyl group is above the um, the carbon one atom, and that is the difference. So in the alpha group, the beta, the hydroxyl group is below and in um, carbon um, beta glucose sorry the hydrox group is above carbon one so alpha below beta above and how should you remember this remember ABBA okay so alpha below beta above the hydroxyl group is below carbon one on alpha and it's above carbon two on uh, carbon one sorry on beta so alpha below 
beta above. It tells you where the hydroxyl group is. We'll come to the importance of that in the next video when we look at polysaccharides and how they're formed. So let's have a look at it, apply what we did a few minutes ago, but now to um, glucose molecules or monosaccharides being stuck together to make um, a disaccharide, in this case maltose. So if we have a look first of all, you can see here is a simplified version of glucose. So if I wanted to just point out, which I will do just um, for this, because I think it's quite useful for you, where the carbons are. We've got a carbon one here, we've got carbon two here, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, and up there carbon six, not important for this moment. Here then we would have carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five. And it's just an understanded way where we make sure we're talking about the same molecules. So if we look at this, we want to combine the, the um, carbon one to, of the first alpha glucose, we'll say, to carbon four of the second alpha glucose. And both of those have a hydroxyl group on the bottom. Remember, the other thing alpha below only counts for the, alpha, the first uh, carbon molecule. Both alpha and beta glucose have this hydroxyl group at the bottom of carbon four. But let's pretend that doesn't matter for the minute. If you look at this, the two hydroxyl groups, the two OH groups um, combine, uh, are lined up, and that means they're close enough to react. So an enzyme would then remove this water molecule, okay, leaving the oxygen. So what do we mean by that? We're taking out a water molecule. That water is leaving, okay, so effectively what we're doing is getting rid of H2O. So imagine we're getting rid of that one, we're getting rid of that one, which leaves this water molecule, this oxygen molecule, which wants to be bonded to two things. It's bonded once to carbon four, so now it's going to try and bond across here because this carbon molecule also has a spare bond. So when that's released, what happens is this oxygen, as I said, binds to the carbon four of um, the original molecule it was attached to and the carbon one of the molecule here. So we call this a glycosidic bond and it's what we call a 1,4 glycosidic bond because it is attached to carbon one here and attached to carbon four here. So as I said, never call it a covalent bond. Okay, it is a glycosidic bond and to extra marks a 1,4 glycosidic bond referring to the carbon numbers. So if this was in an exam, if you were asked how do two alpha glucose molecules make maltose or any monosaccharide make any disaccharide, you could say the reaction between two monosaccharides or alpha glucose occurs by a condensation reaction. So you should always mention the condensation reaction. I would then say this is when water is eliminated or released, and that causes a glycosidic or 1,4 glycosidic bond to occur between the hydroxyl groups, which is what I mean by that is the OH groups, if you're not a chemist, or OH minus groups on carbon one and carbon four, making a maltose molecule. And again, you could then be asked, well, how would this break down? If I wanted to break down the, um, the maltose molecule, back into glucose. And when might this occur? Well, digestion. Or well, any digestion reaction, you're doing the opposite. You're doing a hydrolysis reaction. So if you're asked how does maltose digest in uh, the small intestines, you might later talk about something called um, dipeptidases. So malta, I'm sorry, no, you wouldn't, that's, that's proteins. You might talk about um, malta, maltase breaking down maltose. And you would talk about them doing a hydrolysis reaction, which is when water is added or used up, I'd say added, and that breaks the glycosidic bond, forming two separate alpha glucose molecules. And that's pretty much it for all of the different things that you're going to talk about, all the different um, biological molecules combine and break up in the same way. Whenever you're combining two, you're using a condensation reaction. Whenever you're breaking the two up, you're using a hydrolysis reaction. And any time you get a question on digestion, it is a hydrolysis reaction. Now, I think it is worth at this point trying to learn your disaccharides. So you need to know that maltose is made up of 
two alpha glucose molecules and even though it doesn't say on here initially it is quite important to know it's alpha glucose sucrose is to alpha is an alpha glucose molecule and fructose and lactose is alpha glucose and galactose you will also need to know which ones of these are reducing sugars to give you in the higher level and that is a reducing sugar is something that will remove electrons from other molecules it's reacting with and reduce them therefore so these are your reducing sugars glucose and glucose in maltose is a reducing sugar a non-reducing sugar is sucrose and lactose is a reducing sugar so best way to remember this is more than likely the only non-reducing sugar you're ever going to take um, on board is sucrose so remember it sucks because it's a non-reducing sugar so let's have a little bit further then let's go a bit sage further let's start looking at the polysaccharides so the long chain of carbohydrates and the first type of polysaccharides i want to look at so think of this as sort of section a here is your energy storage polysaccharides and these are the ones that store the energy away from us in our bodies so we can get them back when we need them so in animals that would be glycogen and in um plants that would be starch and alpha glucose um, is what we're using here still so we're not talking about beta glucose and basically it's thousands of molecules of alpha glucose combined by repeated condensation reactions where we remove water to make glycosidic bonds um, and these are making polysaccharides which are not sugars so the reason they're not sugars is because monosaccharides are all sweet they are all soluble in water and affect osmosis as a result whereas these are not sweet and they are insoluble so have no osmotic effect and the two places they are found you have starch which i said earlier on is found in plant cells and glycogen which is found in animal cells and particularly for us it'd be places like the liver or the muscles now these are particularly good as energy storage polysaccharides because they have key properties now obviously when we want the energy we want to be able to take the energy from glucose um, break it down in respiration to release ATP something that we studied later on in an upcoming video but there are four key properties of both um, but both starch and glycogen have in common because they are storage polysaccharides they are extremely compact and they're able to be compact because they are um, in a spiral structure meaning you can hold more glucose together now i'm going to link that one direct to that one because because they are compact and there's so many hydrogen bonds between all the different molecules this means they are insoluble that is particularly good because one of the problems of glucose is it causes osmosis so if you have too much glucose in a cell it will cause um, uncontrolled osmosis but these molecules are insoluble so what that means is they will not dissolve in water and if something doesn't dissolve in water it has no osmotic effect it won't cause osmosis to happen which is why you don't have loads of water rushing into your liver to try and dilute the um, the glycogen in there now also it's made of chains of glucose and at the end of each chain basically the enzymes can act on them snipping off the glucose by hydrolysis reactions and they are branch chains um, at different levels more branched in animals as we'll come on to in a few minutes so starch is made up of two main molecules amylopectin and amylose and you need to know the, the combination of these and how they make starch so the first molecule said it's amylose um, and this is why your your enzyme in your mouth is called salivary amylase because it breaks down long chains of alpha glucose so amylose is a long chain of alpha glucose of over a thousand molecules long so if you're asked to describe the structure you would need to say it has been made from alpha glucose combining in glycosidic bonds one four glycosidic bonds would be even better using condensation reactions it is compact and it is insoluble in water um, and basically it is what makes glucose up in long chains long coils of glucose molecules and even this is why we can test the um, starch because the iodine that changes color when you add it to starch gets trapped in the middle and starts reacting with all of the glucose molecules as a result
it is reduced, I believe. A mylopectin is the second one, and whereas this one is also chains of uh, alpha glucose, and they are glycosidic 1 4 bonds making those chains. You can see here one attached to the next one by a 1 4 bond, this one is a 1 4 bond this one is a 1,4 bond. They also have the occasional 1,6 bond, which means that there are branches, it better, really bit better here if that's the main chain there, a branch coming off here of for glucose. So it's a spiral shape with branches emerging on it. Now it is more compact than amylose, um, but it has these branches which give it a large surface area, making it easy for enzymes to hydrolyze and take away glucose molecules. As I said before, starch is a test for um, I sorry, starch is tested for using iodine, um, which is you don't really need to know, but it's in potassium iodide solution. And if it goes from yellow brown to blue black, starch is present. It's a positive result. Hopefully you already know that. Now the opposite of um, starch in plants is glycogen in animals but actually opposite is not really a good idea because they are virtually identical starch is um, alpha glucose chains and it can be broken down in respiration just like um, it can be for uh, sorry, glycogen is alpha glucose chains, just like starch is what I'm trying to say. The difference is because you may be asked how they're similar. Well, they're similar because they've got alpha glucose molecules, 1 6 glycosidic bonds, they are branched, they are compact, they're insoluble in water, all the properties we talked about earlier. But these ones are shorter, so they are absolutely shorter, okay, and they have more branches coming off them. OK, now that's important because they need to have more branches because animals have a higher demand for energy than plants do. So by having more branches, there's a bigger surface area and a bigger surface area means more enzyme activity. The enzymes can hydrolyze those glucose molecules off the chain quicker and therefore that can be respired quicker to create the ATP from it through respiration. And then the last section we're going to look at today is structural carbohydrates. So we've talked about alpha glucose making energy storage um, polysaccharides. We so for structural polysaccharides, we need to focus on beta glucose. So just to remind you, beta glucose, alpha below, beta above. The OH is above carbon one of the uh, glucose molecule. Now I'm drawing this on because carbon four is also important. OK, so don't forget, it doesn't matter whether it's alpha or beta, the OH is always below carbon-4. So this causes us a problem because we need the OHs to be aligned. So if we had two of these beta-glucose next to each other, then they, the OH groups wouldn't align and you wouldn't be able to have this high um, condensation reaction. So how do we... Um, solve this issue or how does biology solve this issue well basically if this beta glucose is facing the normal way it's facing upwards alpha alpha below beta above the oh group is above but this one what they've done is we've rotated it 180 degrees so the beta glucose is upside down now this would be carbon 4 don't forget where normally the oh group is below but it's upside down now so it's now above OK, and this means you can remove a water molecule via a condensation reaction to create a guan 4 glycosidic bond. And the next one would be the right way around. It would be upwards, which would mean that on the carbon 4 here, if you had it drawn on, you'd have an OH here, which means, again, the next one could work and so on and so on. So this one is the right way around upwards. This one is downwards 180 degrees upwards, 180 degrees downwards. So how do we explain this in an exam question? Well, what you would say is by rotating the beta glucose molecule 180 degrees to the last one, both hydroxyl groups or OH minus, I should say, um, can be aligned, meaning the removal of water via a condensation reaction, creating a glycosidic bond or a 1,4 glycosidic bond, if you want to be more precise. And then what happens as a result of this is the cellulose chains actually create long straight chains. So because they're not um, alpha glucose, because there's a difference in the shape of the bonding, it causes straight chains as opposed to the um, 
as opposed to the uh, helical shapes of alpha glucose in the energy storage polysaccharides. So each one of these beta chains, beta glucose chains, is called a cellulose chain. It's a long straight chain and there's so much of it, it's actually the most abundant structural polysaccharide on the planet. So then this isn't the final stage though. What happens is that there's lots of these long straight chains of uh, beta glucose you can see here. And then between the chains, there are hydrogen crosslinks or hydrogen bonds. And that adds to the strength of these molecules. Okay, now why that is so useful is because that then creates layers that are combined into each other. So why does that happen? Well, it happens between the OH group on the bottom of um, carbon uh, number two and the OH on carbon six and the hydrogens on um, o of the OH group there. So you get these hydrogen bonds in form and lots of hydrogen bonds between lots of cellulose chains make something called a microfibril. And then the microfibril is actually combined together due to a mixture of hydrogen bonds and pectin, which is like a glue to make a macrofibril. So they are extremely strong um, molecules of cellulose, which is important for its role in the cellulose cell wall, which gives the structure and strength to, an, um, to plant cells. You also need to be aware there are other types of structural polysaccharides. There is chitin, which is in exoskeletons of insects, and then bacterial um, cell walls are made up of a molecule called peptidoglycan, which will have similar things such as high amounts of carbohydrate and um, hydrogen bonding and um, glycosidic bonds, allowing the strength of that structure.